Bibles, would you open with me to 1 Peter chapter 1? 1 Peter chapter 1. And today we're going to do five chapters. We're going to go through it very quickly because if you remember, we did an introduction when we started it last fall. Then we went through it slowly. And now I want to tie the whole book together and remind you of what we learned. So that way when God is speaking to you, that you're ready to give a reason for the hope that lies within. We've got to take this word, we've got to hide it in our heart. We're in dark times, and it's going to get darker. Now, so what I'm doing today is an overview of 1 Peter. Any, any book that's five chapters or more, I do an overview. So let's open in prayer. Father, again, thank you that you will give the words and you will give the heart and you will give the attitude of what we need to understand this book. We humbly come before you seeking your face, your will. So if there's anything that's in our hearts that's hindering us from hearing you, Lord, we say take it away that we hear you clearly, that we have your heart for this world, for the lost. And Lord, that wherever we go, we bring the precious fragrance of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Peter opens this letter, and again, I'm not going to look at every verse. There will be verses that go on the screen, even though they're gonna be in your text. But they'll go on the screen because they're key verses I want to address. But some of the verses I I want you to follow, and I'm just going to point out things. These are triggers to remind you what is in this book, because this is what the Holy Spirit, again, I want to remind you, will bring you back to this when you're in a situation. Maybe a friend's going through a situation, and this is important. This is why we do this. So Peter opens his letter, and that's what is a letter epistle, Praising God for providing salvation. That's something that we all should praise God for. God has given himself for you and me. Not just for you and me that are saved. He's given himself for the world. And whosoever believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Isn't that worthy of praise? And this is what we need to to remember. We should be the happiest, most joyful people in the world. Well, providing salvation, how? We saw this, and we'll talk about it as we go through, but really his death and his resurrection. His death and his resurrection, it's important to understand, the gospel always contains these points. Jesus died for the sins of the world. He was raised on the third day. The Father accepted that atoning sacrifice. And because he was raised, we too know that we will be raised from the grave one day as we put our trust and faith in him. And we walk by faith, not by sight. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, not in the book, but a cross-reference I want to remind you of. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. People like to think they're good, good enough to save themselves. If salvation depended upon you being good enough, guess where you'll go? Yeah, we don't want to think about that. But see, he knew and willingly went to the cross. At the end of the message, we're going to do communion. Communion is a a reminder of what he has done for you and for me. Maybe you're an unbeliever here today. I don't know. Someone visiting. This is why we do it. And this is to be done even openly. We've done it in the parks. We do it different places. It's confusing. But from the time to time when you're doing that, people ask the question, why do you do that? Just as when we go down and we baptize people, sometimes people say, well, What's all this about? And you proceed to tell them the gospel. Peter 
was blown away. All those years later, he just never got tired of praising God for what he's done. And if you and I ever get tired of praising God, something is wrong with our relationship with God. Well, again, he's writing us, again, this amazing salvation that we have, and that salvation is always in Christ Jesus. Apart from Christ Jesus, there is no salvation. It's his work, and this is what we trust in. Well, this amazing salvation is to be lived out in the midst of this very dark, evil world I'm hearing more things each day that are going on. People are fretting and worrying. And while it may grieve our hearts, we should be excited because just knocking at the door very soon, we will have salvation be caught up to be with him forever. But it's a time that you and I need to be ready to give a reason for the hope that lies within. Our friends, our family, those that don't know Jesus is very, very important. Because just as, again, when God destroyed the world once with a flood, God shut the door in Noah's ark, there's going to be a door shut one day. Now, we know it is a tribulation, and we know the church is raptured, but Anyone that goes through that tribulation will probably, if they become a believer, will be martyred. We know the verse, all who desire to live godly will be persecuted. That's not just the tribulation. Now, if you're living for Jesus Christ, you're seeking first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. The world will mock you, laugh at you. Doors will slam in your face. But if you know the word, you know the promises, you have a peace that passeth all understanding. So he's writing this, and this is important, and I'm pretty really slow in the, in, in, in the beginning, but then I'll move very fast. You'll get some wind burn here when we get to that point. But we must prepare our minds for action. You can't be naive. You don't need to be sniffing under every rock for the devil. No, I'm not saying that. You just need to have your eyes open to what is in front of you, beside you, what God might be doing, what God might want to do through you. This is extremely important. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world. It matters, are we doing what God would have us do? Sometimes it may just be sitting with someone, weeping with those who weep, comforting somebody who's lost a loved one someone that doesn't know about the future, is fretting when they see these things and they're not a believer. You don't know. We call these divine appointments when they occur. And I'm going to encourage you. Say, God, how about today another divine appointment? Anticipate and expect. The heart that is anticipating and expecting God to do something great will see God's glory. In the Bible, whenever someone asks to see God's glory, God loves to show his glory. Not arrogant, not self-righteous. Moses saw God's glory. Anyone want to see God's glory today? I do. The greatest glory, let me remind you right now, has seen a changed life, a healed marriage. Whatever it is, an alcoholic, no longer an alcoholic, a drug addict, no longer a, a drug addict, whatever it may be. Miracles happen every day. We don't chase after signs and wonders and miracles, but if you are seeking first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, miracles will follow. What is the miracle of people being born again? Because God wants to use you. And he may use you, and he may not even know because <laughs> he doesn't want it to go to your head. We all have a problem with pride. Would we agree? Yes. So we need to exercise self-control in this time. And the only way that you can exercise self-control, first it is the fruit of the Spirit is love, and, and exercising self-control, that, that's part of that fruit of the Spirit. It's the manifestation of love. But I want to tell you, the way it happens is when you fix your eyes upon the author and the finisher of your faith, 
Lock your eyes upon Him. He'll keep you till that day. He's giving you a promise. Let me read from Matthew chapter 8. Remind you of a couple things here real quick. Matthew 8, 23 through 27. Referring to Jesus when he got in the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm upon the sea. So the boat was being covered with waves, but Jesus himself was asleep. They came to him and woke him up. Save us, Lord, we're perishing. And he said to them, why are you afraid? You men of little faith. Then he got up, rebuked the wind and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. And the men were amazed and said, what kind of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey? They hadn't gotten it yet. There's two things I want to call your attention to. And number one, Jesus was with them. Jesus said they're going to the other side. Jesus, in a sense, when Jesus says something, it's a promise. Even though he doesn't use the word promise, when Jesus said he's going to do something, it's going to be done. They forgot that they were going to the other side, and they forgot that he was with them, and he'll never leave them or forsake them. And right now, even though he's sitting at the right hand of the throne of the Father, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in your heart as a believer. He is the comforter. He's another of the same kind. So we, too, have to remember, no matter what's going on in this world, I know where I'm going. Do you know where you're going? And he's with us. And I don't need to fear. And I don't need to fret. And I don't need to get angry about what's going on because he's on the throne. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Well, look with me in 1 Peter chapter 1 in your text. And I guess it's going on the screen too. I color code it so they know how to do this. Peter, apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside alien scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ, sprinkled with the blood, may grace and peace be yours in the fullest of measure. The first thing I want to remind you of is Peter. Peter, again, he just says he's apostle. He was sent by Jesus Christ. That's what that means. He doesn't give himself any other title. Titles oftentimes go to their head. He's just apostle. He's just saying, I, I'm sent by Jesus. He was an eyewitness, and we can look at that another time in more detail. And I like the fact that he doesn't claim a title. Do you see me? I'm the special, most anointed. I'm the Pope. No. He doesn't say anything like that. It also reminds us how we are to be around others. Not to call attention to ourselves, but to call attention to Jesus. What a wonderful example. Did you notice, again, the readers, they're strangers, they're resident aliens. Anyone here? Strangers? Resident aliens? That's all of us. In fact, the Bible likens us to pilgrims. Our, our home is in heaven. This is just a temporary place. And you know, you haven't heard me for a while say this. The best is yet to come. One day we'll be with him in all eternity. Notice where these strangers were. It says in verse 1, they were scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithia. This is an area that we would call modern Turkey today. Scattered, that word is diaspora, diaspora. Never... Again, commentaries give it different ways, different word studies. It, it's all off the same thing. It means the seed was scattered. Scattered, possibly because of the Assyrians when they came down and conquered the northern kingdom. Or later on, the Babylonians, when they conquered Jerusalem, they were scattered, dispersed. Dispersed, why? Because of their sinfulness. God was dealing with them. The hope was to bring them back to their senses, to purge them of all these things. So these are five geographical areas. And again, these are speaking primary in its main text to Jewish people, but it will include Gentiles. Be very careful if you talk to a Jewish person. 
Because Jewish people, some of the things that are going to be said here are really were said to Jews first, but it will include Gentiles. We're grafted in. We never become Israel. But we're grafted into these promises. Uh, Philippians 3.20 reminds us, For our citizenship is in heaven, for which we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Believers eagerly look for the time that we'll be in heaven. Our family, our friends, our loved ones that have went before us. That's our citizenship. His kingdom is not of this world. It's a heavenly, it's a spiritual kingdom. I'm going to read from the Life Application Study Bible. I, I, I guess I opened it up for this. I don't always look at it, but it, it says this. The, the way to stay true is to keep your eyes upon Christ, to remember that this world is not our home, to focus on the fact that Christ will bring everything under his control. And staying true means steadfast fastly resisting negative influences of temptation, false teaching, persecution. It requires perseverance. When we're challenged and opposed, don't lose heart or give up. God promises to give us strength of character with the Holy Spirit's help, with the help of fellow believers who can stay true in the Lord. He is the one that will make you faithful if you put your eyes upon him. So again, look with me, this, this idea of scattered, disperse the seed, just as a farmer scattered the seed. And he scattered them for a purpose. Let me read in Acts 8, verse 1. Saul was hardly in hearty agreement with putting him to death. This is referring to Stephen, the first martyr. And on that day, a great persecution began against the, the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. They remained there. God oftentimes sends persecution to the believers, to the church, that we go out and share the gospel message. See, they weren't being faithful in the book of Acts. They were staying right there in their comfort zone. And we all understand comfort zone. I have my comfort zone. You have your comfort zone. And God allows this to drive us out. So persecution is not always bad. God has a purpose for it. And when China, again, when persecution came to China, it, it shut down. We had no idea the church. And finally, when the doors opened, the church had grown at, at such large numbers, the world was blown away. Persecution causes the church to increase. And we'll talk a little bit about persecution because that's what this book is about a little. And then in Acts eleven nineteen, so then those who were scattered because of persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way, notice, to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, Antioch being in Syria, and speaking the word, and this is the word to no one except for Jews only. They were, they were sharing it to the Jews. They were the ones that would be, uh, again, most open to it at that point. Now, in verses 1 and 2 of Peter, it, it says they were chosen by the Father, chosen to the, 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 according to the foreknowledge of God. That means before you were even a, a twinkle in your mother's eye, before the world was even created, God chose you. He knew you. He knew all your days. He knew the beginning from the end. It wasn't because you're special or he really needed you. He just chose you. Because he's a God of love. He chose you to be conformed to the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. That you be molded into that, that image. It's so important in Ephesians 1.4. It says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. That's why he chose us. And a lot of people like to, to say, oh, I'm the chosen. Careful. Well, you may be chosen but maybe we're not acting like it. Are we walking holy and blameless in this life? Well, again, we're set apart by the Spirit. The Spirit comes into life and sanctifies us, and that's what he's saying. And we're cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, that, that work of the cross. 
the sacrificial lamb, the lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. So the Father chose you in Christ before the world was even created. The Son saved you when he died for you. But here's a point for you. Unless you surrender to spirit, you'll never have salvation. You'll never go to heaven. It's not just saying a sinner's prayer. It's a surrendered life. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. Oh, you will. He'll finish the work one day. I long for that in my own life. But we receive this, this seal, the promise by the, the Holy Spirit. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The moment we believe and trust and rest in him and know the work is done, but we now need to work out our salvation in fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in us. He's going to change us from the inside out. Again, as I mentioned, this text is primarily, and it, it, it gets hair standing up on some people's heads, on Jewish people. Primary to the Jewish people, but I'm going to say every Gentile. This can apply to them. Let me read in 1 Peter 2.9. It says, but you are a chosen race. Israel was set apart as a chosen race to reveal God to the people. They're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. There's only one nation under God that God honors. That's Israel, and he's been dealing with them again and again. A people for God's own possession so that they may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called them out of darkness into marvelous light. Now, referring back to you, you're a chosen race. The moment that you're placed into him, chosen, set apart to be holy and blameless before him. A royal priesthood, you can boldly go to that throne of grace. You don't need to go through a priest. You don't need to go through a pastor. You want prayer, I'm happy to pray with you. But you can boldly go to the throne of grace yourself. This is what it, it, it's saying. And we're a holy nation that is in heaven. That is in the millennial kingdom when that time comes. And we're God's people. You're a child of God. And the best is yet to come. Well, let's move on. And now we're going to begin to move a little quickly. Bear with me if I'm to get through this text. In chapter 1, verses 3 through 12, there's this thought of knowing the guarantee of our salvation. How can you have peace if you don't know you're saved and don't know you're going to heaven? Would you agree with that? How, how could you have peace? Well, there's the proof. Verse 3 in the text, chapter 1, verse 3, if you glance at that quickly, you're going to see that it is guaranteed by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because he was raised from the grave, we have that assurance that we will be raised from the grave. Well, there's the permanence too. It's in verse four of the text. Look at your text again. It is kept, it's promised, and it's kept for us in heaven. One day, you and I will be ushered to be up in heaven forever. Then, the power. Look with me in verse 5. God's mighty power assures us that we will safely arrive at heaven. And remember, again, the story of Jesus asleep in the boat. He says, we're going to the other side. They had forgotten that. His presence. One day, the believers will be caught up. When the Holy Spirit goes up, we'll, we'll be caught up and we'll be with him forever. Amen. And this is a hope that, that the world does not know. In verses 6 through 9, we see the promise. A again, it's in verse 6. The joy can be ours even in the midst of trials. Even in the midst of trials. James says, consider all the joy when you encounter various trials. Knowing the test in your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have that perfect work. You want to experience a joy, let God have his way in your heart. Well, this is going to produce 
all kinds of things in our life, but I want to call your attention to two things in the text. First of all, in verse 7, it will increase your faith. Guess what? Have you ever prayed, Lord, increase my faith? I have. You know what I just prayed for? Trials. Oh, Lord, I didn't mean that, really. Yeah. It, it means when you want to grow in him, you're going to experience things you will increase your faith because you'll realize that he is faithful. But it also, at the same time, when you're kept by him, when you recognize his faithfulness, verse 8 and 9, if you focus on it, you can make your notes as we go, it increases our love for God. It increases our love for God because you know you're kept by his love until that day. How powerful is that when you think about it? And then in verses 10 through 12a, we see the, the Old Testament prophets and, and their thoughts about salvation. There were some things that they didn't understand in verses 10 and 11. They just couldn't comprehend. May I make a confession? There's a lot of things I just don't comprehend in the, the Bible, and I'm sure you know the same thing in your life. But on the need-to-know basis, God gives us that knowledge. Well, again, one thing that they didn't understand is in verses 10 and 11 in regard to the grief. All that Jesus would go through is suffering. He's the Messiah. Why does he have to go through this? He was the suffering Messiah. They didn't understand that. They had Isaiah 53. They, they could read it, but it just doesn't make sense. And some things when I read it, it just, I haven't got it yet but I know one day I will. There's one more thing that I want to call your attention to. It's in verse 11 in regard to his glory. They didn't understand the manifestation of his glory, what they would see, and, and you know, from the ascension to being caught up, the resurrection, they just didn't comprehend it. Well, what did they understand, though? They knew that the prophecies wouldn't be fulfilled in their own time. They knew they were in the future. They knew that they would pass away. But they knew that if God has spoken it, it is true and it will happen. And I think that's very important for you and me. Do you know when God has spoken it's true, it's going to happen? It's not a matter of when, but it will. And nothing can stop God from fulfilling what he has already said. For example, Jesus says, I'll build the church. He didn't say, Brian will build the church, Ron will build the church. No, he said, I'll build the church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church. Guess what? I don't need to fret anymore. He's in control, isn't he? And he will do exactly what he said he will do. So they knew this would be fulfilled after they left. Well, the angels in verse 12, the end of verse 12, they, uh, they long to know more about this wonderful salvation. They just couldn't understand the salvation. They look at man and go, gosh, boy, God, when he created man, problems began, and yet God has provided salvation for them? Wow. Wow. Anyways, and then in verses 13 through 21, it focused on really holiness. To live in holiness, our, our response to salvation, again, in, in, in verse 13, it's, it's regarding ourselves, is, is we are to live a self-control life, not to live like the heathen, the pagan in this world. Our lives are to, to be totally different. Not only, not only that, and this is important to understand, um, we are to be holy before our God in verses 14 through 16. And this is in regard really to our Savior. We're to be holy as he's holy, set apart for him. He'll make us holy. We're to be respectful to him. Do you realize that he is here today? This is very important. He is here today. And how we act, how we speak, are we focused on things that are not about him? We've come to meet. This is what we call appointed time. In, in this Old Testament, they had appointed times where we meet him. 
And our focus should be on him. Sometimes we like to focus on ourselves. Yeah? And we take our eyes off of him. And that's what happened to the disciples when they looked at the storm and they lost their vision. Well, there's a cost of salvation in verses 18 and 19. At first, it was the, the negative part. You, you cannot purchase salvation with silver and gold. We looked at that. You can't buy salvation. You, you can't be good enough. You can't work for it. Well, the positive part was in verse 19, if you remember. Our salvation was bought with the precious blood of the Lamb, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You and I are cloaked with the blood of the Lamb. In verses 20 and 21, there was the planning of the salvation. We've already mentioned that in a roundabout way, but, but Christ was chosen before the foundation of the world. He was slain before the foundation. God saw it before it even happened. Now, my brains aren't big enough to figure that one out. I can read it, I can understand what it says, but I can't really understand that. God knew centuries before, thousands of years before, you and I would be here and Jesus would die upon the cross and you and I would receive him as our Lord and Savior. You're not an accident. Well, again, in the rest of that chapter, the focus becomes on harmony. This is hard. We're a bunch of porcupines sometimes. We poke one another. It's in verse 22, since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for sincere love of the brother, fervently love one another from the heart, for you have been born again, not of the seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living, enduring word of God. You know, everyone's going to let everyone down because we're human beings, but we are to love one another. You know, love is a choice. I know when you watch the movies and shows, it, it's a feeling. It's more than feelings come after you make a commitment to love that person. Do you remember when people used to get married, it was for better or worse? <laughs> Sometimes it is bad. Sometimes maybe your loved one is bedridden their whole life. Maybe horrible things are happening. But, but love is a commitment that we make and we choose. You're here. Look around for a moment. You need to choose to love the people. Well, I don't love them here. I'll go someplace else. Well, let me tell you, there's some unloving ones there. And you're unloving if you run from love itself. Well, anyways, let's jump into chapter 2. We see our heavenly privileges. It's in verses 1 through 10. I want to call your attention to the first three verses in, in chapter 2. Therefore, putting aside all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander, like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you tasted the kindness of the Lord. Put away these things. Don't say, God made me this way. No. Put these things off. There's the put-offs and put-ons. In the scripture, it was talking about put off like dirty clothes that smell. Put them off. And put on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's what it's talking about. And like newborn babies long for the pure milk of God's word. Not something polluted with false teaching. Apostasy, and that's running rapid in this country and around the world, in fact. But too long. You ever see a baby? <coughs> I know, that won't go on the radio. I'm sorry, honey. Okay. <laughs> they're, they're crying. They want the milk. <laughs> we should want the milk just like a baby longing for that milk. because it satisfies. And that's another clue, whether you've really been born again or not, or, or there's maybe sin in your life that's hindering you from growing and moving on. Well, again, Peter's affirming the importance of the community to perseverance. 
He, he believes, again, that believers are to enter into a relationship with God and that we're living stones being built up into a spiritual house. And you'll find that in verses 4 and 5. And I'm not going to read that, but that's the emphasis. You are a living stone. And you are, are to give yourselves as a living sacrifice. He doesn't want something dead. A living stone built up again upon the rock, Jesus Christ. Well, when we talk about relationships, verses 4 to 12, it talks about Christians. Again, verse 5, there we're living stones. We're royal priests, and we talked about that already. We're chosen people in verse 9 and 10, you saw, and if you glance at it, you can see what I mean. And then in verse 11, it's, it reminds us we're strangers. This, again, this world is not our home. Do you know the scripture's repeating itself? People sometimes have said, why do you repeat yourself? Well, the scripture repeats itself. Because sometimes we just don't get it. Repetition helps us remember. Well, what is Christ when we think about this? A lot of people, they don't know how to describe Christ. Well, first of all, he's our living foundation. He is our rock. We're grounded upon him. He is a precious foundation for every believer. He's a stumbling block in contrast to the unbeliever. It doesn't make sense. Why would a, someone else have to die for my sins? And they have a hard time with that, thinking that they can be good enough. Or sometimes they think that I can't ever come to Christ because Christ would never accept me. Well, he's again in verse 6 and 7, the cornerstone. Verse 4, look, he's the chosen one, chosen before the foundation of the world. He is also the judge in verse 12 in chapter 2. And then he is the light. And, and notice we're, we're called out of darkness into this marvelous light. Light brings illumination and understanding and truth. Well, it's in verses 11 to 25, we, we see our earthly responsibility. Yes, we have responsibilities. First, respect. That's something old school. It's been thrown out the door. There's not a lot of respect in the culture anymore. <coughs> respect for the police, the fire department, doctors, politicians. I know there's some that out there, bad, but there are good, honest people out there that love God. Don't throw them all into one group. That is wrong. Well, again, in verses 13 through 16, th this idea is where to show respect and submission to civil authorities. God's put you here. God's put us in this country. Such a time as this. He's raised up the leaders, and he's the one that takes them down. You're not in control. That's why he's in control, because he has already said what's going to happen. We're also to show this respect, again, and submission to our employers and, and to everyone. We're to, to love people. Hate the sin, but love the people. Because if you hate the world, how, you, how are you ever going to be a light to them? How are you, you going to show the, the gospel to them? If they just see this anger and bitterness all the time, so we're to honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. Again, in, in chapter 2, verses 18 through 20, they may show it on the screen, but I'm not going to read it because of the sake of time. Servants are to be submissive to your masters, and that's your employers. And it goes through this thing of submission. The key, the key main theme in this whole book is really being in submission to God in persecution, submission to, again, those leaders around us, as I just mentioned. In fact, if you stop and think about it, in chapter 3, we'll look at it maybe in a, in a moment, in verse 9, that, that we should bless those who persecute us and not curse when wronged. You ever been wronged by somebody and you want to give them a piece of your mind? That's not what the Bible teaches. That's the way of the world. We're to turn the other cheek and say, no, Jesus really didn't mean it. No, Jesus did mean it. When Jesus spoke, he meant everything he said. While suffering, we're to entrust ourselves to God. This is what this book's about. You, you and I will experience things that are unjust and unfair, 
What are we to do? Entrust ourselves to God. There's no better place to be than trusting yourself to God. And then in, the, in addition to trusting our, ourselves to God, what's important to understand is, is that God will keep us. And Jesus, just as Jesus did this to the Father, he entrusted himself to the Father, we do the same thing. He's our perfect example. Well, he's a role model in verses 21 through 25, chapter 2. He's the sinless Savior, Jesus the Christ. Jesus being the Savior, the Christ is the anointed one, the Messiah. In fact, in 1 Peter 2.21, it says this, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you example for you to follow in his steps. You and I may suffer persecution. You can't change the world. What needs to change is our attitude, our actions, to see the, the people come into the kingdom of God. What he did, he died upon the cross. He, he could have called down all the angels. and No, no, it, there was a plan that God had to go to the cross to pay for our sins, to be resurrected, that we would be caught up to be with him one day. God has a plan. Everything that you go through, he uses for good. First Peter 2.23 says this, While being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Well, what did he do? Verses 24 and 25, that his wounds might heal ours. It's not talking about physical wounds. Spiritual wounds. Come, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. The sin can be such a weight on the shoulders. Mentally, it can affect people, and they never move on the, the guilt of sin. But God sets us free from that bondage. And that we might return to the shepherd in verse 25. Look at chapter 3. It, it focuses on, again, beginning with women. It's carrying this idea of submission it says in verse 1, in the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. They observe your chaste and respectful behavior. We looked at this, how a wife can win her husband to the Lord. You can see these on Facebook or YouTube and follow up if you want to know more about these and, and, and the in-depth teaching up on them. So there's this responsibility for the wives. It concerns their behavior. Wives should depend, their, their, their lives should be dependent upon Christ. They should be careful with their lips and the things that they say. And they need to be careful about their beauty. It's verses 3 to 5, and it's really the inner beauty. You know, you can see the most beautiful person in the world, whether it be a man or a woman. I guess you don't call men beautiful, but you know what I mean. And they could be the most rotten people inside. God's saying, this is what counts, is the heart. Beauty, well, as you get older, it's going to fade. And the beauty inside will shine brighter and brighter and brighter. Peter's example, he uses Sarah in the Old Testament, verse 6, as a role model to follow. There's the responsibility of the husbands, too. Husbands must be considerate of their wives, show respect to them, and if they don't, there's consequences. What are those consequences? Your prayers will be hindered. If you're bitter and anger, you treat your wives terrible, your prayers are not going to be answered. You want to have answered prayers, treat your wife good. Verses 8 through 14, again, we see submission under suffering. In verse 9, it says, Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving blessing instead. For you were called for this very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. This is how we're to live. Notice again, not evil for evil or insult for insult giving a blessing. We're to heap coals upon the enemy's head. Bless those who curse us. That's different than the world. We don't want to hear that because we want vengeance. We want to say vengeance is mine, but God says vengeance is 
mine, says the Lord. Well, there's this subjection to Christ. Christ has put you in that situation. Let me encourage you. I don't know if it would be encouragement, but your wife, your husband, they're the best ones for you. They'll bring out the best in you, and they're going to bring out the worst in you. You know the wonderful thing about bringing out the worst? It's out there in the open, and you can see how bad you are, and you need to confess and repent and say, Lord, change my heart. Yeah. So actually, God can use it for good. Well, there's the responsibilities of all. Well, living in harmony with one another. It, we're to preserve unity. We don't need to make it. There's unity when you meet another believer, isn't there? Naturally. Even if they're in a different denomination, you just know they love Jesus. And that's all that matters. There's sometimes differences. Let's not argue and fight over things that are minors that have nothing to do with Jesus or salvation. Well, again, reward both good and evil with good. One more time, reward, again, both good and evil with good. So someone's evil to you, just bless them. They, they can't handle it. They don't know how to deal with it. A kind word turns away wrath. You may have to say that kind word a few times, but it eventually will break down those walls. Well, again, worship Christ as your Lord and always be ready to give a reason for the hope that lies with it. That's chapter 3, verse 15. That's that key. It's not meant to argue over the Bible, but when people see that your life is so radically different than the world, what makes you tick? How can you go through what you do and still have a smile on your face? Still have a joy in your heart? It doesn't mean you're not going to have moments down because we're human. But the big picture. So we need to be ready to, in a sense, defend our faith. And people take that to extreme where they want to really beat people in the head into the kingdom. You can't beat people into the kingdom. If you start beating them, they're going to go away. They want nothing to do with you. Don't throw your pearls before the swine. Well, our Christian testimonies in verses 13 through 17. Our Christian testimony is seen in our holy living in the face of persecution. You know, we have brothers and sisters willingly dying for Christ giving up their lives in other countries. They know that if they become a believer, they will probably, in some countries, lose their life. There are chaplains that we help support in, in Sudan. They go through a class, Martyrdom 101, knowing that they're going to die, and they go on the field, and they go and minister in villages. And until the last woman and child is out, they do not leave that village. The men have run leaving the women and the children. And they're there, and they know they may die, but they're willing to die for their brother. There's no greater love than one who would lay down his life for another. This is what Peter is teaching through this whole book. It's not going against the world. It's being a witness to the world. This is, and you'll find this in book after book after book. You'll either choose to accept what the Word of God says, or you're going to twist it and make it say anything you want. Jehovah Witnesses do that. Mormons do that. All the cults do that. We need to take God at his word. God said what he meant and meant what he said. Well, Christ's believers, are, the focus is in verses 18 through 22. And Peter describes as, a, 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 again, a fourfold ministry accomplished by the Savior. First in verse 18, his death, the permanence. He died once for all. Once for all. Didn't need another sacrifice. It was sufficient. And the purpose of that, you, you find that in verse 18 as well. He died to reconcile sinners to himself. Any sinners here? If, if, if you're a sinner and you're saved, you have been reconciled to Christ because of what he's done. This is going back to the gospel. His journey was uh, into the spirit world. This is an argument. This is where people will divide. Don't divide over it. 
it's confusing and it can mean many different things, but I'm just going to say this. The, the transgression Jesus preached again, the sins to the evil spirits. And some will go on and say, well, this is the people of Noah that were held and it uh, doesn't matter. Some say he just went, and I kind of believe in this lie, that he went down to those that were looking for his coming and he shared showing that this is what you've been waiting for. I'm here. I fulfilled what the scripture says. And they've gone to be with him now. And then there's a resurrection in verse 21. The resurrection guarantees our redemption. We've already talked about it, the repetition, but it talks about baptism too. Baptism is simply a symbol. That when a person's baptized, they're buried with him and they're raised in that newness of life. That's a symbol, a reminder. And finally, in verse 22, it talked about the ascension and the exaltation. He's caught up to be with the Lord in chapter 4. We move on, and Peter's main concern was, again, the issue of suffering. The believers were going through great suffering. You and I don't know it in this world. The world does. In Sudan, Afghanistan, Iraq, places in the Philippines. China, but not in this country. These may lead to those things. Time will tell. But our actions is what's important. Again, Peter's main concern is when you go through suffering, when you're facing opposition and persecution uh, for their faith in Christ, how are we to live? He's addressing those who are suffering for their faith. They're willing to lay down their lives, not just in a public arena, thrown to the wild animals, but also in their private lives as slaves, unfair, unjust masters, even in their homes, the hatred of the family, leaving the, the faith and trusting in Jesus Christ. So the, the focus here is, is, is helping them be encouraged to continue steadfast in the Lord. Well, sometimes suffering can include mocking and pressure from neighbors. No business, no jobs. In many ways, upon conversion, uh, converts, uh, they become misfits of culture. If you come to the movie, The Jesus Revolution, you're going to see what the world was seeing was misfits at that time. They were hippies. LSD and everything else. And, and a lot of churches wanted nothing to do with it, but Pastor Chuck opened the door. These doors should be open for anybody who really wants to come sincerely to Jesus Christ. I don't care what they look like. I don't care what they smell like. They're welcome. That's the way of the Bible. Many ways upon conversion, again, social and culture misfits as well, and people just kind of separate you. Again, the social pressures sometimes placed by, uh, upon new believers is often intense. People, they just want nothing to do with it. I thought they were pretty cool until they became a Christian. The list goes on. Are you committed to Jesus Christ? This is something that the body of Christ needs to be committed to Jesus Christ. In the martyrdom of Polycarp, it, recorded, it is recorded as, as saying on that day of his death, 86 years, I have served him and he has done me no wrong. This could indicate either that he was 86 years old or that he lived 86 years after his conversion, but he would not deny his Savior. If things keep moving the way they are, you're going to get a chance to den deny the Savior or say, Lord, take me home. It's better to go and be with you. Well, in chapter 4 and verse um, 1 and 11 and then 15 and 17 and 18, the, the emphasis is going to be on really cleansing ourselves, purifying the spiritual believer. There's a triumph. Suffering causes sin to lose its power when you know that you're kept by the power of God. It's a testimony uh, to our friends in verses 4 to 6. And the tenderness is in verse 7 and 9. Suffering should develop our love for other believers. Because you'll begin 
to be able to look through their eyes and understand. It will develop talents. I mean, we should be faithful to use those talents. The gifts are to be used to edify and build up the body. And talent should begin by using it here to minister, especially during a time of suffering. And then in verses 12 through 16, the idea is here, there's a privilege of suffering. It's to be expected. All believers will be allowed to suffer. Every believer will suffer in some way. That's what that was teaching, if you remember. It is to be esteemed. To suffer for Christ means that we share in his past grief. We identify. Until you identify, you really don't even begin to understand. And and to suffer for Christ means to share in his future glory. Everything he has for you and me. And then in verse 19, we have two things in the hour of pain. One, we need to commit ourselves to God. Commit ourselves to God. Second, we are to continue to do good in spite of all the suffering and the pain you're going through until the Lord takes us home. This is a choice to love God. See, if we love God, then we will be willing to do these things. We may not like it, but it's the fact. 1 Peter 4, 19, Therefore, those who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Did you get that? Therefore, those who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator and doing what is right. The book is powerful. One more chapter, we're almost done. The Appeal by Peter. He writes to the elders, and and Peter himself is is an elder. Uh, He becomes that role model on how they are to be role models. Uh, What is their responsibility? Well, we saw in in verse 2, to feed the flock of God, to lead the flock to God. That's what we do. We teach the word of God. Second, there's a reward. There's a a crown of glory for the head shepherd. But let me tell you, you are called to make disciples, just as I'm called to make disciples. And there are rewards for each one of us for your faithfulness. And by the way, he will make you faithful if you want to be faithful. That's that surrendering to the Holy Spirit again. We have to make sure that we stay out of the way. And then in verses 5 through 11, we see we're to live as a servant in this world. We're a slave. We're a servant. Those interchangeable there. And again, he's repeating the same thought again that we're to be in subjection to our superiors. We're to be in subjection to our Savior in verses 6 and 7. In verses 8 and 9, it tells us that we're to live as a, a soldier. People like to focus on, we're in the army of God. Well, okay, yeah. We're a soldier. He's liking it. All that is doing is comparing it to We're not a soldier taking on the world. But what does he mean? We're to recognize our enemy. He's a roaring lion looking for whom he may devour. You think there's anybody here he wants to devour? I think so. If you have a love for Jesus Christ. We're to resist the enemy because he will flee. We talked about that in depth. And we're to live, again, the same idea coming up again as a sufferer. I've heard people say, I'm a sufferer for Christ. Now, that doesn't sound like you're a loving response. Laying down our life is what we do. He tells us in verse 10, remember, there's a duration. It's, it's only for a short time. Any suffering seems like eternity, doesn't it? But it's a short time. And then in verse 11, it, it, it makes one strong, firm, steadfast believer. This is what suffering does. It, it produces character in you and me. Well, it's in verses 12 through 14. He mentions the name Silas. A faithful brother has helped Peter write this letter. And this is important to understand. Are you a faithful brother? I want to be faithful. Faithful unto the Lord and faithful to you guys. Well, 
again, until Christ comes for God's people and throughout the world, not just the United States, it's not a, things aren't around the, about the United States, the world will continue to face persecution. It's reality. The intensity as the days go will increase more and more. The question is, how will you live in these dark, evil times as they get darker? Are you ready to meet him? Are you prepared, you know, getting ready for these times? It doesn't mean that we need to dwell there. But we need to get in the word, and the word needs to get in us. See, God will strengthen those who endure and is present with us. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. It doesn't matter whether it's a time of suffering. It doesn't matter whether it's a time of a confusion in, in false teachers. If you know the word of God, the truth that will set you free, you will not follow after a cult. You will not go after apostasy. Who will go after? Those that have not taken the word of God and hid it in their hearts. God will not allow his elect to be deceived. Well, the letter to Peter encourages all believers simply to hold on to Jesus, who is faithful, he's holy, 